Hi everybody, I have chapters 15 and 16 to our book, Masterpiece, Hitching a Ride, chapter 15. It was nearly seven o'clock by the time Carl, James, and Marvin returned to Pompeia Day's apartment and provided Mrs. Pompeia with a plausible, but not too delayed explanation of why James would need to make another visit to the Met that week. Carl described it as a private art tutorial with the creator of drawings and prints, which managed to satisfy Mrs. Pompadé's hankerings, hankerings for a special treatment, recognition of her child's distinction, and entree into exclusive world upper-class pursuits all at once. They agreed that Carl would come for James on Wednesday at 4 o'clock. When James finally retreated to the sanctuary of his bedroom, Marvin was frantic to return to the bosom of his own family. They would be beside themselves with worry. He'd been gone overnight again, and the whole of the next day, where there was no way for them to know what had transpired. He hoisted himself over the lip of the jacket pocket and began to scurry down the boy's pants leg to the floor. James stopped him with a finger. Here, he said, let me help. I don't know where you're going, but it's out in the hall somewhere, right? That's where you live. Marvin sighed. How wonderful would it be, to be if he could just explain to James where home was and hitch a ride straight there. It would take James mere seconds to cross the apartment to the kitchen cupboard compared to half hour or more it would take Marvin. Here was a truly bothersome inconvenience of being friends with someone you couldn't communicate with in any of the unusual ways. But maybe James would figure out something. It seemed worth a try. At least he'd get as far as the hall. Marvin crawled onto James' knuckles and held tight as the boy walked to the doorway. Don't worry, James said. I'll make sure nobody sees. He cracked the door and looked both ways. They could hear William bellowing in the kitchen. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm coming, William, James called, smiling a little. James was accountably patient with William, Marvin thought, submitting to his hair pulling, picking up his drop toys. None of the beetles could understand it. My mom's fixing dinner, James said to Marvin. It's okay. He crouched and laid his finger on the smooth, polished floor next to the baseboard. Here, he watched Marvin. Marvin started to climb down, but then James said, Hey, you know what? If you crawl to the end of my finger, when I'm right in the right spot, I can put down you exactly where you need to be. He squatted back on the heels, grinning. It'll be like that game, hot or cold, you know? Marvin beamed up at, at, at Adam. James was so smart, he settled himself in the middle of James' index finger and held on as the boy wandered down the hallway, pausing every few minutes and watching for Marvin's reaction. Marvin sat tight. James stepped into the bathroom and poked his head into his parents' room. Not here, Marvin thought, shuddering. He couldn't imagine spending any more time than was absolutely necessary with Mr. and Mrs. Pompadour. What a racket they made with their constant chatter, not to mention the frequent explosions. Huh? James said. I hope you get what I mean. You don't seem to be doing anything. Listen, if I'm not close to where you live, crawl the other way, down my finger, toward my hand, okay? Marvin obligingly crawled towards James' hand. James laughed out loud. James, is that you? That's so funny. Mrs. Pombaday stuck her head around the doorway from the kitchen. James immediately dropped his hand to the side and Marvin held on for dear life. Nothing, James said. I just saw something funny. Mrs. Pompadour looked at him suspiciously. Out there in the hall? I hope you weren't laughing at my, at my statue. Marvin watched her cross into the hall table and tenderly lift a small hand carbon wooden fig figurine of a naked woman dancing. I know some of your little friends laughing at her during the party, but I trust you're more mature than that. The female body is a beautiful thing, James. James squirmed. I wasn't laughing at that, Mom. Well, good, because you're an artist now, dear. You need to show appreciation for the art of different cultures. Even those silly old Eskimo sculptures your father has lying around. Why, when I think that your pretty drawings might be hanging up in somebody's parlor, oh, it just gives me goosebumps. She swooped down and kissed the top of James's head. James stiffened in surprise and slid his hand between his leg, shielding Marvin. When's dinner, he asked, clearly desperate to change the subject. 20 minutes, she said, returning to the kitchen. James walked toward the living room. We're almost out of the little room. 
little guy here. He paused in the middle of the oriental rug, looking around. Marvin stayed close to his hand. See my dad's horse painting? James said softly. Isn't it great? He walked closer, leaning over the couch to stare at it. Marvin leaned toward it, too, balancing lightly on his rear legs. The, pan the painting was bold and graceful with this rush of blue color. You would never know it was a horse unless someone told you, but once you knew it, it was a horse, it was impossible to see it as anything else. James glanced down at Marvin. Do you think I'll ever be able to make something like that? Probably not, he sighed. I mean, I can't even draw. You're the one who can. Marvin looked up at him sympathetically. But why without my ink set, right? James said, smiling. So it is like you need my help. He looked at his father's canvas again. But could you make a painting? I don't think so. Not one this big, anyway. I would take you, it would take you years. We'd be better off to stick to the small stuff. Marvin realized it was possible to have an entire conversation with James without saying a word. There were beetles like that who did all the talking. But with James, it was just like he did the listening too and fill in the gaps with what he knew you would say if you only could. Okay, dining room? James drifted thoughtfully through the archway. Marvin stayed put. Huh? I don't think you live in William's room. Did I tell you we w William ate a ladybug, ladybug once? Yep, he did. Picked it up and popped it right in his mouth. My mom totally freaked out. Marvin shuddered as James continued. Let's try out the kitchen, but we have to be careful because everybody's in there. As they turned to the kitchen, Marvin inched toward the middle of James's finger. James grinned. Okay, getting hotter, he whispered, tiptoeing into the room. Mrs. Pompaday was busy at the stove, stirring something with a metal spoon. Marvin crawled to the end of the James's finger, and James swiftly bent and deposited him onto the tile floor, close to the wall of cupboards. Delighted at the ease and speed of the journey home, Marvin darted gratefully into the shadows. James! Mrs. Pompadour protested. Don't sneak up on me like that. I almost tripped over you. And what are you doing down there on the floor? Tie my shoelace, James mumbled, as Marvin disappeared inside the kitchen cupboard. Chapter 16, Too Risky. When Marvin came through the front door, his mother burst into tears. Oh, Marvin, darling, where on earth were you? I'm sorry, Mama, Marvin began. But before he could finish, she smothered him with a hug, covering his shell with several long legs at once. His father hurried over, clearing his throat guffry. gruffly. Marvin, you had us all worried out of our shells. Why didn't you come home yesterday? You got me in a lot of trouble with your mother. I hope you realize, forever allowing you to stay behind. We went to a museum. A museum? What? Mama's eyes widened. You left the apartment? Marvin, you have no business doing human things like that. It's too dangerous. I know you want to help, James, but not at the risk of your own life. Why, your father and Uncle Albert made a trip after trip to James's room looking for you. We had no idea what had happened. I'm sorry, Marvin said again. He explained about the drawings at the mat, the visit to Christina's office, and the surprise of being knocked to the floor and left there. Oh, Mama cried, darling, you're lucky you're still alive. What were you going to do there anyway? Marvin sighed. So much has happened since yesterday. How could he make his parents understand? I'm hungry, he said. Could we talk about it at dinner? Mama nodded. Yes, yes, of course. You must be starving. Here, sit down and eat something. It's been a long day for all of us. So the three beetles gathered around the rectangular pink eraser that served as their kitchen table, and Mama heaped it up with foil platters and hearty digestibles, tiny steaming broccoli florets from the Pompadour supper, two cubes of cheddar from William's lunch, crispy brown chicken skin, a lemon rind, a crushed potato chip, and a cherry lifesaver for dessert. Marvin hungrily devoured every morsel, and between mouthfuls, haltingly relayed the story of dearer the missing virtue drawing on his own effort to copy the fortitude and Christina's plan to stage a theft from the museum. His parents were so astonished they stopped eating halfway through the meal and just listened. When Marvin was finished, Papa took his head. Well, that is amazing. Faking the theft of their own picture? Huh? Not the real picture, though, Marvin said. My copy of it. 
Mama smiled at him. I'm sure it was lovely, Marvin, and I wish I could have seen it. But humans lead such complicated lives, don't they? Why would they steal something that they couldn't sell or even hang on their own wall? Marvin hesitated. He understood that somehow. Maybe you just have it because it's so beautiful. Then when you could look at it whenever you wanted. Well, I don't think it makes any sense. And it's wrong. Humans are masters at making their own trouble, Papa agreed. I'm just glad you're home safe. It's time to put this all behind you. I can't, Mama. What do you mean? Christina Balcony, the woman at the museum, needs James to make another copy of it. A really good one, which means he needs me. To do another drawing? Mama shook her head vigorously. Darling, no, you simply can't. It's too risky. Your mother's right, Marvin. Papa chimed in. The family didn't take this from the beginning. We wanted you to get rid of your drawing altogether. Remember, you can't get more involved. It's dangerous for everyone. But I'm sorry, Marvin. You know, I know you want to help James, his mother said gently. You tried your best, but it's time to let the humans work this out on their own. Mama, please, you don't understand. James can't do the drawings himself. He's counting on me. Mama took Marvin's leg firmly and led him towards the bedroom. What I understand is that if this has gone on long enough. It is an elaborate deceit. That's what it is. For a good purpose or not, it's all wrong. Don't you remember the saying, Oh, what a tangle web we weave when we first practice it to deceive? Marvin rolled his eyes. Mama, that's a spider saying. It applies just as well here. You're helping James to mislead people. You've been missing twice overnight under the circumstances that could have gotten you badly hurt or even killed. Enough, darling. It's time for bed. I'm sure you're exhausted after your adventure at the museum. But, Mama. Good night, Marvin. Sleep tight. Don't let the bed bugs bite. She nestled him into his cotton ball bed, kissed his shell, and left the room. Marvin lay on his side, wide awake, staring at the wall. Today was Monday. James was supposed to return to the museum after school on Wednesday to do the new drawing. He thought of the boy hovering over the blank page with no idea what to do. How could Marvin abandon him? Was this the very heart of friendship, Marvin thought? Your willingness to help each other in a jam, to take a friend's problems as your very own. <sighs> Marvin sighed. He had to think of something before Wednesday afternoon, or James would be in big trouble. Wow, we're going to have to see how they get out of that. Next chapter, 17.